Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Tackling the Challenge of FFPE DNA Extraction, an automation-ready solution designed with an NGS focus. I am Christina Mahalik of LabRoots.com, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. Next generation sequencing, sample preparation, and other genomic workflows involve many tedious and error-prone steps. Beckman Culture Life Sciences Automation and Genomics Business Units work with customers to develop individualized solutions to help accelerate workflows and achieve more reliable results. The company's portfolio of genomic products currently include nucleic acid extraction and purification kits built on a patented solid phase reversible immobilization SPRI technology. SPRI is a high performance nucleic acid purification technology using paramagnetic beads to selectively immobilize nucleic acids by type and size. Optimized binding conditions allow for highly specific separation and cleanup protocols. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We will try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right hand corner of the slide window. And if you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button on the lower left corner of the screen. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credit. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Kathy Monkvold, PhD, staff scientist, Beckman Culture Life Sciences. Kathy has more than 15 years of molecular biology experience. She is currently a staff scientist at Beckman Culture Life Sciences, researching and developing genomic reagents. Kathy received her undergraduate degree from Lycoming College, Master's of Science degree from the University of Georgia, and PhD from Cornell University. I will now turn it over to Dr. Monkvold for her presentation. Dr. Monkvold, the floor is yours. Good morning, and thanks, Christina, for the introduction. Um, and thank you all for attending today's webinar on formalin-fixed paraffin-embedded tissues, challenging samples in cancer research. So today for this educational webinar, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what formalin-fixed paraffin-embedded tissue is and why it's important, especially to cancer researchers. And then I'll go on to discuss some of the opportunities and challenges associated with this sample type. Uh, I'll move along to discussing DNA extraction from FSP for genomic sequencing and the importance of yield, purity, and quality and the impact of those on downstream applications like next generation sequencing. Um, and then I'll conclude the talk with um, our development journey into a robust and yet flexible DNA extraction chemistry and workflow, and provide some data uh, that supports this development. So what is formalin-fixed paraffin embedded tissue? Well, this sample type um, usually is, occurs after a biopsy is taken, um, which is often used to determine whether a patient has cancer. So after the biopsy, the tissue is fixed in formalin, which is basically just a solution of formaldehyde. And the formaldehyde fixes the tissue in place both macroscopically and all the way down to the molecular level. 
Um, and it preserves the tissue and doesn't allow it uh, to decompose as if it was, uh, as it would if it was unfixed. After the fixation, the tissue is dehydrated and then infiltrated with paraffin. And paraffin is just simply a wax that provides support to the tissue. And this is important um, for being able to take very thin slices of the tissue uh, with an instrument called a microtome. And that's shown here. And this instrument can precisely slice the samples into uh, slices just a few microns thick. These slices can be mounted on slides and stained uh, with different staining techniques to allow clinicians to determine whether uh, a patient's tumor is cancerous or not, and even the grade of the cancer that might be present. And that's shown uh, here by this uh, micrograph. So another important aspect of this sample type is that it doesn't require special storage conditions. It can be stored at room temperature or more preferably at four degrees. And it can be stored in quite high density situations. Um, and it can uh, be preserved for years upon years and accessed later in time. So, um, this sample type is, of course, important to cancer researchers for determining if cancer is present. But if we can unlock the genomic information that's present in these sample types, then cancer researchers can match the mutations that might be present in that cancer with the type of cancer and its histology. And this really unlocks a powerful tool to drive precision me me medicine. And that allows doctors to give patients more targeted therapies towards the mutations that are present in their cancer. And these types of chemotherapies can be more effective and also have less side effects compared with a generalized chemotherapy. It's important to note that this has really taken off in, say, the last 10 years. And that is partially due to the advent of next-gen sequencing technologies, which takes advantage of sequencing really short reads. So this type of DNA that you extract from these samples can tend to be of smaller size, but it's not affected um, in NGS sequencing because you're just compiling uh, short reads upon short reads. Another um, improvement that is really benefit benefited this field is that the library construction methods that are required for next-gen sequencing have really improved over the years and allows re researchers to use far less input than was initially re required. So FFP samples have been processed for over 100 years. And Back in the late 1800s, no one was really thinking about, well, I might want to sequence these samples and determine their mutation spectrum. Um, because sequencing really didn't take off until the 1970s. And because of this, there are some challenges to overcome when dealing with these sample types and extracting DNA. So formalin causes DNA cross-linking, and that's important for the fixation and the preservation of these samples. Um, but it can also cause fragmentation and base pair modifications. And these are all challenges to overcome um, when looking to sequence these samples. So I want to talk a little bit about the main hurdle, and that's the cross-linking. So DNA exists in its double helical form, um, but it doesn't just float freely in the cell. Uh, Many of us know that it's packaged around histones, and these are proteins that the DNA is wound tightly around. Um, and then those histones are further packaged into, to, um, or these nucleosomes are further packaged into chromatin and uh, make up the chromosomes. So when the fixative hits the, the tissue, it actually forms covalent bonds between the proteins and the DNA, as well as between the DNA and other DNA that it might be close to. So in order to utilize the tissue, when, or utilize the DNA once you pull it out of the tissue, you need to remove these covalent bonds. Otherwise, polymerases won't be able to um, proceed and synthesize new DNA from the DNA. So I've talked a little bit about 
the cross-linking uh, challenge. And I've mentioned that this can inhibit polymerase activity. It can also inhibit the denaturation of the DNA during PCR. Um, and because of this, it can reduce the library yield. So there are some mitigation strategies that help in overcoming these hurdles. Um, one is to optimize the lysis and decrosslinking method and really get rid of all of the decrosslinks, uh, the crosslinks that are that are possible to remove in, in the DNA. Um, another mitigation strategy would, to, would be to look at the quality of your DNA ahead of time. How is it going to perform in something like PCR? Um, and there are various tools that I'll touch upon in a few minutes um, to do just this. So another challenge is damage to the bases within the DNA that occurs due to the formalin. So formalin can um, over time transition to formic acid, and this really affects the bases within the DNA. It can cause abasic sites where there's just no base present along the DNA backbone. Um, and so the polymerase can get stalled at this point or even just um, put in a base that um, doesn't match the base that was present. So this can lead to uh, artifactual mutations that might be present, although this usually occurs randomly and can be taken care of with bioinformatic methods. So um, another issue is that cytosines can be deaminated into uracil, um, and then that uracil gets matched up with a T when the polymerase uh, comes across. So you get C to T transitions. So again, artifactual mutations that might show up in your sequencing. But again, these are random. Um, some mitigations to, to, this, uh, to um, the damage that occurs is to use uh, modified fixation conditions, um, conditions that don't allow the formalin to turn to formic acid as easily, and also to uh, really look at your sample storage conditions um, to make sure that you're using optimal storage. Um, some companies have actually produced enzymes that are able to repair some of this damage. One is uracil DNA glycosylase, or UDG, um, and this enzyme removes the uracil that, um, that came from the deamination of cytosine. And then if paired with a cocktail of enzymes, there can be others that add back the correct base into, the, um, into that abasic site. So NEB has a, a, uh, an enzyme cocktail that does just this. So the third major uh, challenge with this type of tissue is fragmentation. And fragmentation can, of the DNA can just exist within the sample itself, but it can also happen during um, the extraction process. And this can, if, um, if the fragmentation um, exists in, in a, a very, um, if there's a lot of fragmentation present, then this can reduce the library yield and even uh, reduce your ability to detect mutations in the sample. But again, by optimizing the decrosslinking and lysis method, you can overcome some of uh, this problem, as well as looking at the quality prior to library construction and knowing what type of sample you're dealing with. So it's often thought that it's just the age of the FFP tissue that is predictive of whether it'll perform well in NGS or not, but really there are other aspects to consider. So um, like I mentioned earlier, it's the sample storage conditions, uh, the fixation conditions to begin with are really important, um, as well as the extraction method that you choose for your samples. So with all these challenges, can um, they really be mitigated to produce high quality NGS data? And if we look in the literature, we do find that there are quite a few publications that compare fresh frozen tissue to FFPE tissue, and the extracted DNA can give similar um, results from, from both types of tissue. So, so there is evidence out there that it is um, a great sample type, and there are actually millions of these samples that are stored in biobanks 
and hospitals around the world. So being able to access this information that's stored in them and the corresponding clinical information about various types of cancers uh, that might be present also allows researchers to make connections between what types of mutations cause cancer. So it's really an, uh, a powerful system for doing cancer research. Um, so I've told you a little bit about the challenges uh, that you face when you're trying to extract DNA um, and use it for NGS downstream, so I want to go over some of the quality tools that are available to researchers and how we can look at yield purity and yield purity and quality with those. So um, I'll start here by sharing two different methods that can be used to determine the yield that's in your DNA after it's been extracted. On the left, we have a nano, some nano drop results. And this is a spectrophotometric uh, assay for determining concentration of DNA. And on the right, we have picogreen. And this is a fluorescence-based assay that utilizes a dye that binds double-stranded DNA. And what you'll notice is that with the nanodrop, um, we get much higher concentrations than we do with a picogreen assay. And that's because the nanodrop measures the total DNA content within your sample, whether it's single-stranded or double-stranded, whereas picogreen um, measures the double-stranded content. And this is important for some library construction methods, which require double-stranded DNA to add adapters um, during library construction. So if you're going to use um, an assay or a, a downstream application that requires double-stranded DNA, um, it's always better to go with picogreen. You'll also notice that when RNAs is removed from the workflow, and RNA would then be present in the sample, it inflates the nanodrop readings uh, by more than double. And in the case of picogreen, which should be specific to double-stranded DNA, there also is somewhat of an inflation of, um, of the concentration. So if you ever, um, uh, so it's important to remember that when, if you don't want to use RNAs in your samples. Um, another aspect of quality that we look at is purity. And so um, the nanodrop does a really good job of this. And we can look at different ratios of absorbance, um, usually at 260 to 80, which is shown here in the light blue and 260-230 shown in the dark blue. So the 260-280 ratio gives you an idea if you have contaminating proteins present in your sample. Um, and for pure DNA, this ratio should be around 1.8. And you can see that most of these tissues are falling right around there, or most of this DNA. The 260 to 30 ratio gives you an indication of whether your sample is contaminated with other contaminants that might absorb at 230. Um, and this includes salts, among others. And this tends to be um, somewhere where FFPE tissue is, is um, known to have lower 260 to 30 ratios. Uh, but pure DNA would be around 2. So this is another way to assess your DNA, how well your extraction performed. Um, you can also look at the distribution of fragments within your sample. So fragmentation does occur within FFP tissue. And you can expect um, many times that you might see um, a profile like the one on the left. So this is uh, DNA that's been extracted from a tumor FFP tissue source. And you can see that the peak of the fragments is around 3,000 base pairs. Um, and the dis distribution is, is pretty broad. On the right, we have a, an FFPE reference tissue. So this is a really high quality tissue that's been optimized um, to get really nice DNA out of. And here you can see that that distribution is very narrow at greater than 60,000 base pairs. Um, 
in these tape station traces. So you can expect to see wide variability within FFP samples from block to block. Um, you can also see differences in, in your quality assessments, even moving through the block from one um, end to the other. And so the final tool that I'd like to discuss for determining quality is a, using qPCR. So I've told you that uh, the cross-linking can be a real problem for polymerases to the point where they stall if they hit a point where a protein is still cross-linked um, and can't proceed and amplify the DNA. So using qPCR gives you an indication of whether that's a problem in your sample. Uh, this particular assay utilizes the amplification of a short fragment to give you some idea of just your quantification of the DNA that's present in the sample. Um, and then it compares the short fragment amplification to that of longer fragments, a 129 base pair and a 305 base pair. And as you look at those ratios, you can tell um, how easily the polymerase can access the DNA. And, and to what length. So on the left here, we have that horizon reference tissue, which has really high quality DNA. Um, and you can see that the ratio of the 129 to 41 fragments is pretty high, around 0.8. And even as, as you move toward the ratio of the 305 to 41 fragment, that ratio is maintained at 0.8. When we look at actual blocks of FFP tissue, we again see this wide variability. In this case, um, the ratio of the 129 to 41 fragment is giving us still a pretty good ratio for FFP tissue of 0.6, um, but then that 305 to 41 ratio drops down to 0.2, telling us that there's something about this particular sample that doesn't allow the polymerase to really extend much further um, into that 305 fragment. So with all of these different quality tools that researchers have at hand to assess their DNA, um, it, they can give you an idea of how your sample might perform in library construction for downstream sequencing, but really it is going through the library construction itself and looking at the quality of the library that is the most indicative of what your results are going to look like at the end. So um, many researchers use combinations of these, one or two, some just make the library because these samples are um, so valuable, they may not be able to get uh, another biopsy, for instance. Um, so you just go right into sequencing and you get what you get. Okay. So um, this field is really a burgeoning field. Um, in fact, there's been almost 30% growth in the number of samples that have been analyzed since 2013. But what we find when we talk to researchers is that only about 50% of them are satisfied with their current DNA extraction method from FFP tissue. So that tells us that there is a lot of room for improvement in this space. And of those who are interested in switching, um, only about 20 of them have switched recently, telling us again lots of room for improvement in the methodologies for extracting DNA. So when we did talk to researchers, we learned um, some interesting things about what was most important to them. Um, yield is the number one um, um, factor in looking at an extraction chemistry, and purity and quality are also really important, and how, um, how the DNA fun functions in downstream sequencing um, is also important. Total purification time and the hands-on time required, and its compatibility with automation are another, um, another subset of items that are really important to researchers. And if they're able to reduce the amount of time they spend on extraction, then they can free up researchers to do other work in the lab. Um, and a, a one more thing that was important was the avoidance of hazardous chemicals. 
So typically, um, and historically, FFP samples have been deparaffinized, so the, the wax is removed before you can get at the DNA, um, deparaffinized with xylene. And xylene is an organic compound um, that is just really hazardous and um, to work with. So this was another concern. And we also found that flexibility is important to many labs. So, uh, some labs will have an ebb and flow in the number of samples that are coming in to the lab. So at some time, uh, they may just have 20 samples per week, and maybe a manual workflow would be uh, more effective for them. At other times, they might end up with 500 samples per week. Um, and so an automated workflow is really important. And being able to move between these two easily and still maintain the high yield and high quality that's optimized for NGS workflows is the most important factor. So although there are some automated solutions available currently, many of them are only semi-automated. So they begin um, uh, after the the deparaffinization step, or even just for binding the DNA, washing, and eluding it. So we wanted to, to focus, um, we know that, that customers are really interested in a fully automated workflow. So knowing what customers and researchers were interested in, we set out um, to develop a robust and flexible DNA extraction chemistry and workflow. So now I'll describe uh, the workflow and a little bit about how we optimize the chemistry and the data um, that we generated during development. So our major goals were to create a really simple to use product. And that meant minimizing the total number of steps that were required uh, in the extraction. We also wanted to minimize the centrifugation steps. And this is important when transferring a manual process to automation. Um, and it allows you to, to work in a much higher throughput manner when a centrifuge is not involved. We wanted to minimize the temperature changes um, and eliminate hazardous chemicals. And many of the solutions that are currently available are spin columns. And there's a recognized risk of clogging of those columns if the tissue isn't digested enough or um, if too much input is added to the sample. So we wanted to use a chemistry that didn't um, have this challenge. So we came up with a pretty simplified workflow. Um, most workflows have several steps. Um, so I'll run through those. First is the deparaffinization step to remove the paraffin, then a lysis step where an enzyme chews up the protein, um, followed by a decrosslinking step to remove those crosslinks. RNAs is typically included to degrade the RNA present in the sample. Um, a binding step followed by a washing step to eliminate all the contaminants and then elution. So we went through each of these steps and optimized each one for the best performance possible. Um, in the deparaffinization step, shown here, uh, we used a, a non-hazardous uh, component, in this case it's mineral oil, to remove the paraffin from the sample. And the mineral oil actually uh, plays two roles in the chemistry. It dissolves, uh, it solubilizes the paraffin, um, and then in subsequent steps, it provides a, a barrier for evaporation so that when you're automating the method, you don't have to worry about sealing your plates during the long incubations um, or high temperature incubations. Uh, the next step is lysis. And here um, you would add your lysis buffer to the sample, which sinks to the bottom and carries the tissue with it. Um, and it's in this lower phase where you add the PK and the proteins are degraded. And there you can see the, the mineral oil play, uh, forming this evaporation barrier. 
So there is some flexibility provided at this step. Um, we recommend a minimum of an hour, but it can go several hours or overnight, depending on how much um, lysis time you need to fully lyse the sample. Then we're following it up with a decrosslinking step, and this is simply heating it to a high temperature. And it's known that high temperatures can reverse some of the crosslinks that are, um, many of the crosslinks that are formed by formaldehyde fixation. Um, here again, it's important that this is a, a high temperature step, so it's about 90 degrees. And there's a real balance here between decrosslinking your sample and degrading it. So we, we use 90 degrees as a maximum, but there is some flexibility to reduce that temperature and make sure you're getting the best quality possible out of your samples in terms of decrosslinking. Then there's a quick RNA step at room temperature, uh, followed up by the binding step. So here, um, to avoid that clogging we talked about before, uh, we used a bead-based chemistry, which is our spray technology, to bind the DNA. And because FFPE extracted DNA can be fragmented, we wanted to be sure we, we were using a binding chemistry that really grabbed all the DNA out of the solution. So even those smaller fragments um, are bound by this chemistry. Uh, the beads are magnetic, so they can be pulled down, uh, pulled away from the solution with a magnet. The rest of the lysate can be removed. And then we, we made sure that we created a wash, a simple washing strategy. So we created a wash buffer that removes most of the contaminants in the solution, and then just follow that up with an 80% ethanol wash that removes any remaining wash buffer from the sample, as well as any remaining contaminants. And then we also provided some flexibility in the elution step. So here you can elute, um, provided you have a low elution magnet, in as little as 20 to 25 microliters. Um, and of course, you can scale up the elution volume as much as needed. Um, and you, you can also use water or a trist-based um, elution buffer is also sufficient. So this workflow uh, works really nicely, both with manual extraction, which it does have one centrifugation step, but it can be transferred to automation with no centrifugation steps. So once we had, um, or while we were developing this and once we had the workflow in place, we wanted to make sure we were getting the highest yields and purities possible with these samples. So there are um, quite a few commercially available kits on the market currently, so we used those to determine whether um, our yields were what re uh, other researchers would expect to get. Um, and that can be seen here on the left. Um, we use various sample types, and you can see from block to block, sample type to sample type, um, you get very different results with a single slice uh, of tissue, a 10 micron slice. Um, and we found that we were um, in some places better, in some places equal to uh, commercially available kits. Um, and then we also looked at the purities in terms of the 260-280 and 260-230 ratios. And um, this was a slide I showed earlier, but you can see that the ratios look really good um, for, for this extraction with different sample types. Um, because we know that a lot of cancer researchers want to use this DNA in next-gen sequencing, we really wanted to be sure that our extraction method wasn't going to affect the sequencing in any way. So one thing that can happen with an extraction method is that you could be biasing the part of the genome that you're um, extracting uh, with your extraction method. So one way to know that that wasn't happening um, was to use whole genome sequencing at low pass just to look at the average GC content. And what we found for two samples shown here is that we got 41% GC. So there was no bias toward high GC or low GC content DNA um, after extraction with our workflow in chemistry. 
We also know that cancer researchers um, often use ex exon exome capture in their work. Um, so we wanted to use this NGS uh, platform to again look at whether we were biasing um, ourselves towards certain regions of the genome. And in order to do this, we looked at extracted DNA versus control DNA that had not been extracted by our methods. Um, and this is DNA that had come from a control cell line. And you can see that the libraries that were uh, constructed before the capture um, are very similar to the extracted DNA versus the control DNA. And the pooled library um, also looks really nice. So, so we're getting that peak at 300 base pairs as expected. So the data from our exome capture sequencing revealed that um, for the control DNA, which is shown here on the bottom, um, compared with the extracted DNA libraries, we got basically the same results in all of the metrics that we tested. Here I'm showing you the uniformity of coverage, and you can see that um, we are getting the same results between the control DNA and extracted DNA. And same for the target coverage at 1x, 10x, 20x, and 50x. So again, it doesn't look like we're biasing um, what we're, we're pulling out with our extraction method. Um, and again, we also know that cancer researchers are often focused on targeted amplicon sequencing and looking for specific mutations within cancer hotspots in the genome. So here we uh, use an amplicon-based approach and we sequenced six libraries and found that in all six libraries in um, so I should back up and mention that what we extracted the DNA from is the horizon reference tissue. And this reference tissue has specific allele frequencies for all these mutations shown here. So when we made libraries, um, we found that in all six libraries that we sequenced, we identified the variants uh, that were known to be present in the sample and that the variant frequencies that we obtained from our sequencing were very similar to the expected frequencies um, that are, are known to be present in, in the tissue. So this just gives us more um, data to support that this extraction chemistry is really optimized for uh, NGS technologies. And finally, um, I've mentioned that we wanted to focus on providing a fully automated method um, for flexibility for cancer researchers. And uh, this slide is just showing that when the method is fully automated from deparaffinization all the way through elution, um, we get basically the same results as you would when you're using it um, manually. So here we're showing double-stranded DNA, um, 260-230 ratios and 260-280 ratios. And those are very similar for both um, automation and manual extraction. This was, uh, that data was produced on the Biomech 4000. So this is a, a, a more simple type of a liquid handler that can handle about 24 samples at a time. The fully automated method only takes about 15 minutes of hands-on time. Um, at the start, and it can process 24 samples in about four hours. We also have a, a higher throughput method uh, that we've automated on our Biomech, Biomech FXP. And again, this is a fully automated method from deparaffinization to elution, and um, it takes only about 15 minutes of setup time, and it can run through 96 samples in about 5.5 hours. So I should back up and mention that manually we can run through about 24 samples in four hours as well. So um, uh, for the Biomech 4000, it's the same timing, but it frees up um, an entire researcher's four hours. And in the case of the FX, um, it allows um, a lot of freedom within the lab for researchers to do other work. Um, and 
uh, in the interest of time, we'll glaze over this. This is just to show that we have a, a demonstrated method um, that's been verified on the Biomac. Okay. So in summary, um, I've talked to you a little bit about the opportunities and the challenges that are associated with genomic sequencing of FFP uh, extracted DNA. Um, and I've walked you through our, our development process um, and shown that we've really created a workflow and a chemistry that is, uh, gives great results for yield and purity and um, functions and is really optimized for NGS downstream applications. Um, so we now have a new product um, and the data that I've presented today um, this product is commercially available, and the data I've presented today was all generated with this product. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and to mention um, that um, this work was not done in isolation by me, so I'd like to thank the entire Beckman R&D team that uh, worked so hard on this project and take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Munkel, for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the que uh, question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Um, so here we go. Uh, question one, how much yield do I need for successful NGF? Well, that's a really good question and something we, we certainly spent a lot of time thinking about as we tested the different NGS methods um, with our extracted DNA. Um, and many factors govern the input requirements um, for library construction. Um, one of the first ones is what question are you trying to answer? Is it a variant detection in your sample? And if that is the case, then you need to think about what is the expected frequency of the variant um, and possibly the percent of tumor that went into your sample. So, so if you have a low percent of tumor, uh, you might need to increase the, the input then so you're sure you're sequencing um, the variants that, that you're hoping to detect. Um, another consideration is what type of sequencing are you doing? So is it the, uh, whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, or possibly amplicon? So with something like targeted amplicon, you may not need quite as much input um, as you would for other types of sequencing. Um, and finally, uh, it's again going back to the quality issue with this DNA, it's important to consider that. So if you have lower quality DNA, it might uh, uh, require more input. And then finally, uh, thinking about your particular library construction kit, many of those will have um, input requirements suggested, and if they're not specifically um, suggested for FFPE, you may need to increase the amount of input you put in, um, or you can contact their tech support lines. They're often very helpful. Excellent. Thank you so much for that information. Um, let's see. Our second question today asks, if I wanted to evaluate Forma Pure DNA chemistry, who, do I, uh, who should I contact? Um, well, that's a great question. Um, in fact, we can put up a poll right now. Um, so if you're interested in evaluating, you can click yes, um, and someone from Beck Beckman will get in contact with you uh, to let you know how you can, can get yourself some to, to test out. But in the future, you, um, if you're not interested now, but you are in the future, you can contact your local sales rep from Beckman um, or just go through the website. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we've got some great questions today. They keep coming in. Um, if I wanted to evaluate Forma Pure DNA Chemistry, oh wait, I just did that one. 
Uh, can you please expand on the automated method timing? Um, yes, and actually I'm joined today by my colleague, Zach Smith, who is an application scientist for automation, so I'll let him field that question. Um, hi, so I'm Zach, and uh, as far as the, the automation timing is concerned, uh, for a 96 sample uh, processing time, uh, on the Biomech FXP, uh, we're looking at about five and a half hours. Um, I would like to note that a lot of that time is incubation time, um, so there's uh, not a, a huge amount that the automation can speed up as far as like the number of samples being processed. So for example, you're going to process you know, 24 samples in approximately uh, 4 hours and 45 minutes of, of machine time. So on the other hand, you do get a lot of uh, you know, time savings when you consider the number of samples being processed from 24 to 96. So it, uh, the FX takes advantage of the fact that it is a dual pod liquid handler, uh, and we use that multi-channel pod for doing like full plate transfers, for example. Uh, while we're using the span pod for doing uh, reagent aliquoting uh, for the wash buffers and whatnot, so that we're reducing as much as possible the amount of reagent that's required for the number of samples being processed. So, trying to make the most efficient use of your kits and your time. Thank you so much for that answer. Our next question is how much tissue should I use to get sufficient DNA for my NGS application? Um, another great question. Um, again, this is going to kind of depend on your particular application. Um, it can depend on, again, if you're looking for a particular variant, um, the percent tumor that's present in the FFP splice that you're using. Um, and the quality of the block, but we generally recommend as a, just a basic starting point uh, is to test out one 10 micron section, see what you get, and then adjust from there. Excellent, thank you. Um, uh, another great question, um, is the mineral oil paraffin removal step done manually or on the same instrumentation used to isolate DNA? So um, I'll let Zach handle this as sure. well for the automation. Right. So uh, during the course of doing the automation development, we, um, <laughs> we realized that starting with the curls themselves was really what uh, people wanted to do. They wanted to be able to just load the curls up in a tube or a plate and put them directly on the deck and let the instrumentation handle it. Um, for that purpose, we developed a, a new tube rack that allows us to put uh, 1.4 ML matrix tubes uh, directly in a 96 well format, but the tube rack itself is also uh, open on the bottom so we can move it on and off of Peltiers, for example, when we need to do our heating and cooling. Um, the tube rack also, because the bottom is open, allows for the uh, tubes to also take advantage of the 2D barcodes that are associated with those tubes, so you can uh, scan a whole plate's worth of barcodes so that you have the sample accessioning required for your, uh, your samples once you're processing. So basically, for the automation solution, you load your curls up in these tubes, you put the tubes in the tube rack, and the mineral oil addition is handled and the lysis is handled on deck. Uh, once the lysis is complete, the, uh, the biomet goes through and pipettes underneath, uh, underneath the mineral oil layer and transfers the lysate to a new plate, leaving the mineral oil behind in the original tubes. Okay, and how do you remove the mineral oil? Is it uh, pitted or soluble in the downstream wash buffer? Um, so, so kind of piggybacking on that previous question, the, uh, the mineral oil is uh, left behind in the original lysis tube, and we transfer the lysate into a fresh plate. Yeah, so the, there's a, a two-phase separation where the mineral oil is always on top um, and the lysate on the bottom. And how, uh, how do you improve the 2060-2030 uh, ration in the, in the workflow? Um, okay, so the, the 260-230 ratio is, um, is tricky, and we, we spent a lot of time um, improving this particular um, metric, and, and mostly it was um, through optimization of our, our washing strategy, our wash buffer that's provided in the kit, um, as well as the, the downstream 80% ethanol wash. Um, and from where we started to where we ended, we improved it quite a bit, um, but there is just 
some part of that that's governed by the sample. And there's just such variability in these samples um, that, that that remains the big challenge with FFP tissue. Thank you. Excellent. Um, our next question is, I missed, uh, missed some of the beginning. Can I get a copy of the slides? Thank you. Um, yes, this uh, webinar will be available for download on the Lab Roots website um, after today. So, so you can always go back to it and see what you missed. Wonderful. Okay, we've still got some more uh, great questions coming in. Um, how do you recover older FFPE samples with the uh, overfix and extensively cross-linked? Um, yeah, that's a, a real challenge. Um, so with those, um, of course, you're, you may need to optimize your lysis time. Um, and so, so maybe you need to take a little longer uh, to degrade the proteins that are present and allow for the decrosslinking to be a little bit more effective. Um, and this is certainly an optimizable step that we've gone um, all the way to overnight for our, our lysis uh, conditions with, with really good results. You can also, um, I mean, if it's, if it's super cross-linked and you need to further decrosslink it, you could go longer. Um, I wouldn't recommend going higher on the temperature during the, the decrosslinking, but that's something that you might be able to track with um, a qPCR assay to determine if this is really helping your situation or not. And I would just like to add, as far as the automation solution is concerned, all of those variables that she was con uh, that Kathy was talking about modifying are you, you can modify them in the user interface of the method. When the method launches, it defaults to the to the kit's uh, recommended times and temperatures. But all those all those variable all those times and temperatures are optional as well. So. All right. Thank you for that information. Our follow-up question. Um, oh, this is great. Uh, what is the minimum lysis time? Um, we recommend one hour um, for for a starting point. It, it works well for for most samples. Um, and then we recommend extending from there if you have hard to digest tissue or um, maybe increased input, like more slices in a sample. Thank you. Um, our next question asks, do you have FFPE RNA extraction kits? If so, are they manual or automated? Uh, we do have a, a kit that is um, uh, is for RNA extraction from FFP. It's just called FormaPure, um, and and this has been available for for a while. Um, and Zach can talk yeah, about the automation. Right. The, the current FormaPure uh, method is automated. Uh, where right now we are in the uh, one of my other colleagues is in the process of trying to uh, sort of take what we've learned with the FormaPure DNA uh, automation solution and apply it to the FormaPure RNA solution, so you can allow you to put your curls straight on the deck. Um, so um, that work is currently ongoing, um, but it, it, we do have a good solid base method to work off of. So, Thank you. Excellent. Um, looks like we have one more question coming in. Um, looks like it reads, with the manual method, how is the magnet used to extract the beads? Um, so the, the Fry beads um, that we use in many of our, our chemistries, if not all, um, have a magnetite core. So um, the magnet just pulls them right out of the solution to um, the magnet for a plate is usually a ring on the bottom of your well. And so it pulls those beads out of the solution right to the ring on the well, at the bottom of the well. And then you can use your pipette in the center to remove uh, the liquid and, and then carry on with the protocol. And then we do have some magnets um, for in uh, tube format, which pulls the beads then to the, the side of the tube. Thank you, Dr. Monkfold. Uh, I just want to let everyone know that we are running short on time. So that will be our last question for today. However, I do want to let everyone know, our audience, that if you have any follow-up questions, you may do so uh, once 
you um, after the, the webinar, you can go to the webinar, watch it, and submit your questions that way as well. Once again, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Muxbold. And do you have any final comments that you'd like to wrap up with today? Um, no, I think we pretty much covered everything. I just want to thank everybody again for attending this webinar. Thank you so much for your time as well. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Beckman Culture and Life Sciences, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through September 2017. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast is available for replay. We invite you to forward this announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. We will see you next time here at LabRoots. Goodbye. <laughs>